love the sentiment of that song of the the recommitment that it suggests of we need mercy, we need God's mercy because we're so weak and we do sin and I love the I love the hope that that song gives. Good to see you, friends. Very grateful for everybody who's present. Very thankful for those who are visiting with us. I got a call this afternoon uh, from Brother Orby, and he appreciated the lesson, and he was asking me about something because he and the people who were with him were listening. I think he had some family there. And when I got to that story about the lady who gave the young man, the young song leader, a hard time, I used the phrase, she ripped him a new one. And he asked me, he says, what, what, what did you mean by that? I said, well, I've just given somebody a hard time, giving them grief, tearing into them. That's the way I've heard it used before. And he said, I figured you were thinking that, and that's what you meant by it. He says, but... In other parts of society, especially in the factory, it means a whole different phrase, that there's normally a curse word associated with it. And I didn't know that. He knew that. And I appreciate him giving me the benefit of the doubt. So if that's what it is for you as well, I I do apologize. I shouldn't have used it like that. I didn't mean it like that. I don't know where a lot of this stuff comes from, you know. um, Give them down the road or something like that. Well, what's that mean? I don't know. I just know that it gives somebody a hard time. That's what I meant by that. I think I've heard the phrase like tear him a new page. I think that's kind of what I was thinking of. So anyway, I'll try to avoid that euphemism. Uh, Good thing is I've only used it like five times in my entire life, so it shouldn't be a real hard thing to dismiss. And truthfully, the way I learned it was at the deacons meetings. They use it all the time. So that's, that's where I got it from. I mean, if the truth be told. So that's the way it is. But no, I do pre- and Orby, I, I do appreciate your attitude, brother, and the way you handled that. So we were looking at love uh, this morning because God is love, and you can't dismiss this. And in fact, it's so important, love is. Paul says you could, you could have all the gifts of language. You can have the gift of the angel's tongue, which no man has ever possessed. You could have all the other abilities and you could even give all your stuff away and even your own body and sacrifice for someone else and burning your body. But if there is one person you don't love, all that stuff's in vain. That's how important this is. Love, it is so important to be a person of love because this is the commandment that Jesus gives us as his disciples. God's love, so we love and we learn to love. It's hard to love, but it's the commitment we've made to be like him, a person of love. We noted in 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul went through various things to explain what love is. A lot of detail given. We looked at several of them, how it's patient and kind, it does not envy, not arrogant, doesn't behave rudely, all very, very important thoughts. I thought of how... When you think of this, it's kind of what James is saying about how this royal law, I mean, think of it, a royal law, it's something that's supreme, it can't be surpassed. And this royal law is that if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love, love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and you do well. Now, what he goes on to say is we can understand the importance of obeying God in all things that, you know, you may have somebody who does not commit adultery and that's good, but the law also says don't commit murder. And he says in verse 11, now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. And we can see that. You know, a person who doesn't commit adultery can't raise their hand up and say, well, I'm okay because they... Don't commit adultery, and yet they still murder. Well, you're condemned because you violated a different aspect of the law. And really, his point is not adultery and murder. His point is love. I may not be committing adultery. I may not be killing people. But if I don't love, right, I'm still violating the law. So we have to be people who accept this and adapt to it, apply it in our lives. It's just so important. It's so important to love. 
Elsewhere we see in the Bible where John says in 1 John 3 and verse 10 that here's how you can distinguish between somebody who is truly of God and somebody who is of the devil. Here's, here's what you look for. He says the children of God, the children of the devil are manifest. This is how you tell them apart. Whoever does not practice righteousness, that's important, is not of God. You've got to be holy as God is holy. You can't dismiss that. Nor, though, is he who does not love his brother. So it's not just holiness, it's love. You have to have both to be of God. 1 John 4 and verse 21 says, This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Again, is there, is there a single person in your life, is, is there a person in this room or at this church that you do not love? That's possible. That's very much possible, especially among brethren, which is why we're told all this. Well, t today's the day to get rid of that. Today's the day to put that away because we can't, we can't harbor that. We've got to commit to a better way of living. And so we are committed to love. Now, we understand the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek language has four different words for love. And when God is telling us to love one another to love our enemies, so on and so forth. He is teaching us to do this agape love. And that is certainly important. That's what he's expressing here. And then really, if you look at it, it's, it's an active love. It's something that people do. Agape love. Whoever loves much, does much, is what one person said. And what this suggests is you may not feel like it, but you love anyway. You do what's good. You do what's right. You do what's, what's, what's appropriate, what's courteous, and what's gentle and kind and all those good things. You do them, even when you don't feel... And you know, really, where we need to apply this more than any place is in home, in the marriage. You may not always feel like showing love, but that's the task we have in marriage among other things, but it's especially true in our relationship with one another. Now, listen to this. This is really cool. There is a newspaper columnist and minister, George Crane, who told of a wife who came into his office full of hatred for her husband. And she says, I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he's hurt me. Well, the doctor said, okay, I've got a plan for you. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. And after you've convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. And so with revenge in her eyes, she smiled and said, Beautiful, beautiful. That is a great plan. Is he ever going to be surprised? So she did that. She started acting as if she loved this man. For two months, she showed this love, kindness, and listening, and giving, and reinforcing, and sharing. And she didn't call the doctor back. And so he was concerned. So he called her and he said, are you ready now to go through with the divorce? And she said, divorce? Never. I discovered I really do love him. And so her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. I mean, look at it. That's what he's saying. Love is this. Love is that. Love is. Not an emotion. It's an act. Right? It's something we do. Good thought. Sometimes you hear it said, you fake it till you make it. You know, in other parts of life, you fake it till you make it, till it becomes who you are. Well, you love. Just love until you connect with it emotionally, we might say. But still, even if you don't, you still do it. You do goodwill. Love others. Well, if you keep looking at this list, we went through several of them this morning. We're not going to finish the list even tonight. I hate to tell you. I know. But we're not. But he does go on to say in verse 5 that love is not easily 
provoked. Now we looked at it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, not easily provoked. That is, here's a person who's not uh, quick-tempered. You know, he's, he, he's a person who is not ready to be offended. Is that not a good message for our society today where people are ready to be the victim, ready to be offended, ready to have their feelings hurt, ready to be angry at people for being mistreated? You know, when I, when I look at these definitions, to, to me, when I came to this one, I thought of the athletes. You know, you see this sometimes in different sports where athletes will flop. You know, they'll act like they were hurt, they were fouled, and they'll put on this great act, you know, to get the other person in trouble, but they, they were wanting to be injured. They were wanting to be offended, if you will. I can be that way, and you can as well. We can do that at home, which is dangerous. We don't need to act that way, but we can do this in our relationship with one another. And as it says in Proverbs chapter 14, that's not a wise person who acts that way. Proverbs 14, it says, in verse 17, here's what the Bible says. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. Well, let me ask you, how many people are in prison right now because they didn't control their temper? How many people did not control the moment and let their emotions get ahead of them, and they acted foolishly? with a quick temper. How many people right now are in confinement because of that? That's all it takes is one moment of foolishness. And a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and God is telling us this so that we might not act that way. James says in chapter 1, here's what we need to do. James 1, common words, we've heard this, but it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, Slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. we got to be people who avoid this idea of being oversensitive. To having our feelings hurt, right? Ready to be upset, ready to be, like I said, um, a victim. Not looking for ways to condemn others, being a fault finder. I thought of this in Luke chapter 11. This is uh, something we see that Jesus had to deal with. I mean, you talk about a person who had to walk on eggshells, you know? I mean, there was nothing he could do with some people. They were going to hate him no matter what. And Luke 11 is an example of that. In Luke 11, the irony is here are people who are supposed to be the people of God, and yet they're acting quick-tempered, easily provoked. But here's what it says in Luke 11, verses 53 and 54. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So they were just looking for reasons to be offended by him or for reasons to condemn him. I don't know who wrote this, but it says this. What is love? It is silence when your words would hurt. It is patience when your neighbors curt. It is deafness when a scandal flows. It is thoughtfulness for another's woes. It is promptness when stern duty calls. It is courage when misfortune falls. That's love. And what we see in Luke 11 is when people are looking to condemn, invent things if they have to because of their, their bitterness within, what that is is hate. It's not love. And guess what? It's not of God. Even though they were professing to be of God, they were not of God because God is love, and this is not love. Love is not like this. And so to help impress some of these thoughts this evening, Brother David is going to lead us in a few songs throughout the lesson and I've asked him to lead us in number 394, Love One Another. Angry words. 
good, so let him never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey his blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy. Friendship is too sacred far. For a moment's reckless falling, thus to desolate and mar. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey his blessed command. Angry words are lightly spoken. Bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred. Brightest links of life are broken by a single angry word. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey his blessed command. Thanks, Dave. So continuing down this list in 1 Corinthians 13, we come to another one in verse 5 that says, Love thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil. And really what this is referring to is love doesn't keep a record of wrongdoing. The reason we commit to this type of love is because that's what God's shown us. God has the ability to remember everything we've ever done. He certainly has access to that awareness about us. But his promise to us is this, that if we are in Christ and we obey the gospel and we commit ourselves to him in humility, his promise to us through the blood of Christ is that their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now he can know it, obviously, but he doesn't hold it against us anymore. He forgives and he forgets. And since God loves us enough to help us rise above our failure, that's what true love does with one another. That we help each other rise above our mistakes and we don't keep bringing this stuff back up. That when it's been forgiven by God, handled properly, then love moves on. Proverbs chapter 10, it says in verse 12, in light of this, Proverbs 10 and verse 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Now the best way to see this is with a parent and child. That when the child makes a mistake and is moved on, is ready to move on, well the parent says, let's just move on from it. Don't do it again. Get up and try again. Don't let it define you. Well, love does that. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 9 says that he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Now we understand the implication. The implication is that the sins that have been corrected and made right and no longer a part of their life, that's the stuff he's talking about. That's when love comes in and says, okay, let's cover this up and let's just act like it's not ever happened because we're going to move on from it. That's what love does. But it's only when it's been taken care of properly. But once it has, we move on. 
Proverbs 19 and verse 11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Well, obviously he's not saying that we don't discern between good and evil. That's not what God's telling us. He tells us to judge righteously. This is how you can tell apart a child of God and a child of the devil is he who practices righteousness is of God. Well, that's judgment. you got to judge between good and evil. But here he's teaching us that once evil has been corrected, we let it go. This is all I know of this lady. I don't know anything about her. But Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, was reminded one day of somebody who had done something hurtful against her many years before. And she acted as if it had never happened. She had never heard of this incident. She was surprised by it. And one of her friends says, do you not remember that? And the lady says, well, no. I distinctly remember forgetting about it. That's a great attitude. I distinctly remember forgetting that. Letting it go. Moving on from it. Now again, we can do this when sin has been taken care of, right? That's when God forgets our sins is when we've had them forgiven, when we've taken responsibility for them and we, at least as his people, have confessed our sins and we repent of them, then he is faithful and just to forgive us. It's, that's when he moves on, when we've corrected our sins. So anybody who would come to the message of love and say, well, you can't condemn me. Love covers all sin. You can't tell me to change or repent well that's not love that's not how God loves us and really that's why love gets a bad rap you know sometimes we don't hear lessons on love because we've seen love abused when people who would want to justify sin will do it under the umbrella of love the message of love and they abuse love and so to run to the other extreme we don't teach on love we teach against sin and yet what we see from this is it can be reconciled in a proper way. That when sin has been corrected, that's when we move on. That's when it can be covered. That there is a right way to move on from sin. When it comes to sins against one another, it says in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, if your brother sins against you, go and t tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Which means what? You've gained him. Move on from it. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And definitely the origin of marking and avoiding, disfellowshipping is being taught here. But my goodness, my goodness, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. That, that's a euphemism for some that, in reference to God, I apologize, I didn't mean it that way. But my word, is it not possible for some Christians to have had sins in the past that they've repented of, they've taken responsibility for, they've corrected, and it still be held against them by others? Is it not possible? Yes, it is very much possible. And the problem is this, it's sending people to hell with that attitude. We cannot be people who bring up the past. And we cannot be people who still measure people by things they repented of and been forgiven of. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, it says this again, reminding us that here's what love does. Above all things, have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of of sins. Don't keep bringing it back up. Someone once said to John Wesley, I never forgive and I never forget. And that man responded to that person by saying, well, sir, I hope you never sin. And that's right. I hope you never sin because we all need mercy. But if it's forgiven, love moves on, thinks no evil. And so let us sing how sweet, how heavenly. And especially note verse 3. When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes all above, each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. And so may we think about that as we go through this.